Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. This week, we are going to talk about partings and farewells. And this week's topic was inspired by my closing my Brooklyn office. Um, I had kept it open even though we moved to Cape Cod. The movers came. Uh, so they've taken the remaining books and artifacts and so on. And there was a big week with people in whom I've had a relationship for a long time sometimes of how to say goodbye and what that might look like um, as we parted from one another. Uh, we're distinguishing uh, this from a kind of a wrenching loss, and the word that seems to characterize it is poignant. We're very much in the feeling realm because there is a kind of sweet sorrow to partings. So with all that said as a preamble, here we go. Yeah, I think the idea of sweet sorrow says a lot, Deb, because mm -hmm. what we're really saying is that when we have a poignant farewell, it is an acknowledgement of our attachment to the person or the thing or the place that we're saying goodbye to. Yes, that in order for a parting to mean anything to us, there has to be something authentic the way in which we have been meeting, the way in which we had been holding the relationship so that it affects us. And as we were preparing to talk about this today, we find ourselves naturally returning to this idea of parting in a way that is soulful, that is fully experienced. And when it's fully experienced and conscious, that the parting holds a kind of blessing in it, a kind of hope for something good to, mm -hmm. to continue and to sprout mm -hmm. from the parting. There is such an acknowledgement that we have mattered to one another, that we have had a journey together, our, our hearts have touched and been touched by one another, uh, there has been a story here. And there's a sense in me that with a parting, it's, it's a story that has come to a close in a gentle way. Yeah, there's a sense of fullness of things having run their course and completed a full cycle. Mm-hmm. And there there may be a lot of sorrow in that, but it isn't a sense of the parting being wrong or out of place. And one of the criteria that I've been mulling over in terms of knowing when a parting is happening in the right way is that it feels beautiful. And in the way that beauty can bring us to tears, as well as to exalt us and with joy, but that the parting has an aesthetic to it that signals to me that that this is right and what's happening is right even even though it feels you know gut wrenching in some ways i mean it, for me one of the literary images of this is <laughs> i'm just aware that i refer to this book a lot it's at the end of the lord of the rings when bilbo and frodo and gandalf and others go off to the gray havens and it's a real parting it's a real farewell a forever farewell but it feels like it is right that that should happen, as sad as it is. That's the story. They all had their incredible quest and adventure and relationship, and it came to an end. And I'm just aware, too, that, you know, I had said to my Brooklyn clients that I would return through the end of 2019. 
And so we have had um, maybe not all the glories of the Lord of the Rings. Um, <laughs> however, it has come to a, a fulsome kind of conclusion. And it feels um, somehow, as much as I would love for things to somehow continue, there has to be an ending to an important process. It's also an, a kind of avoidance maybe for things to go on forever. Uh, what if, you know, the, what if there is a seasonality to this, you know, of the, the quote from Ecclesiastes and that song to, to every season, turn, turn, turn. It feels like it wouldn't be really true and right. Yeah, there is a time for endings. A yeah, time for endings, at least in person in Brooklyn. And I spent the afternoon, the day before the movers came, uh, saying goodbye to my office and all of its little artifacts and and pictures and books and so on. And it's been moved up here, but it's it's held an awful lot of meaningful human process. I can feel, you know, it is, uh, makes me teary. So Deb, resting into that profound experience and leading up to it, how, how do you feel that your soul prepared itself and you to, to go into that in the right way? What do you think? Wow. What, what an amazing and difficult question. I think part of it is that there was a time frame, and that certainly helped me, uh, that uh, the time frame was through the end of 2019. Another was the sense that uh, getting back and forth from Cape Cod to New York was becoming onerous, wearying, and that that was telling me it's time for this kind of travel to end. Another was uh, having, um, I have an office over, over the garage here, and it's really a wonderful space. So I had a new toehold, uh, a new place that could be dedicated as it, as it were. So there seems to have been an incremental over this last year and a half, uh, growing into a sense of rightness around this kind of parting. And I noticed a process changed with um, my clients, the people that I've worked with. People tended to make appointments when I was in Brooklyn and sometimes touch base in between. And there, anybody can do that. They're all welcome to touch base anytime. Uh, I'm just not in Brooklyn, but I'm still here. So I think that sense of that there is, um, you know, a link or a channel that at least is a possibility helped to make it not quite so final. And yet there is a real sense of an ending with pictures of my office and that this is the last time here. I don't know if I've answered your question, though. Sure. I think one of the uh, pieces for me, which I really resonate to, is that that you were nursing the parting in the imaginal world long before it landed in the physical. Yes. So that you were holding it in that way soulfully and kind of nursing a kind of transition and an attitude around it. Yeah, that's a lovely way to say it. You know, one of the things that I heard in your story there, Deb, is uh, that sometimes we can feel the ending coming and we want to avoid it because we know it's going to be painful. So we put it off or we minimize it or mm -hmm. I know, uh, you know, moving, I, I, ha I had a move once that, you know, wasn't terribly far, you know, from one city to another, it's only a couple of hours. And of course, when I said goodbye to everyone, I said, Oh, well, you know, I'll be back all the time. But, but you know, it never is really like that. It's never really like that. So I think we kind of lie to ourselves a little bit and to each other that it's not really a parting. We try to avoid it a little bit sometimes, don't we? 
It's like reading your high school yearbook. It's like, I'll love you forever. I'll see you. And all the, I mean, I read my high school yeah. yearbook recently and there's all these promises of endless, you know, connection right. that, you know, it almost immediately disappears. I think that's reasonable as a high school senior <laughs> to not know about the aesthetic of parting. But yes, we defend against it by mm-hmm. yeah. imagining uh, mm-hmm. that all these things will be unaffected. Right. Or, th- or that we'll stay in touch and it will be almost as good. You know, we'll, we'll write. We'll, and of course, sometimes we do and we do stay connected. But we might be cheating ourselves out of that really fulsome experience of farewell, too. I'm thinking about exactly what has ended. And there was a place and a rhythm and a quality of relationship that has ended. Uh, and I think it was, it was important for me to feel it. And for them, too. And people part in different ways. I mean, it, it is hard to part. For some people, there might be a new beginning. For some people, it was important to speak what the process had meant to them. There were all kinds of styles and ways, you know, of having a goodbye. But the quality that even now I can see in your eyes, Deb, is that it, it is an, a deep honoring of the parting for you to be so full of feeling, for your eyes to well up. It says something to the other person mm-hmm. that even in the midst of this farewell, that the relationship is ending in such a treasured state. And that's rare in this world. For things to end with such a, with so much value still held yeah. in, in the relationship. Yes, because sometimes when we know we have to say goodbye to something, we strip it of value in advance of saying goodbye mm-hmm. in order that it will hurt less. Absolutely. And we see it all the time. Yeah. I think about my kids going off to college and it was sort of like, boy, I can't wait to get out of here. You know, I can't wait to get away from mom and dad. So it was exactly that process of, I'm not going to miss home. This place is driving Mm -hmm. me crazy. Mm -hmm. And again, I think developmentally or just emotionally, I don't know that there are inappropriate ways to part, but, but there are a variety of ways uh, in which we part, depending upon, you know, how poignant it is, how full of feeling it is, and how much of that feeling, you know, we have inside of us and and can hold on to and suffer, uh, uh, bring it into consciousness and, and feel it to whatever extent is possible in that moment, given the two people involved. Well, I, I think the word appropriate always jingles around my <laughs> head because then I, you know, I find myself thinking yeah. about, you know, what would the culture approve of? And I think that, you know, if we think about Facebook postings, people love to post their wet endings of things and say that, oh, how much they wish the other person well and how much wonderful things are in the future. And, you know, it's, you know, it's about four sentences and it's all about a kind of bright, shiny, impervious process as they transition into this heroic next stage. And there's something that the culture finds that very tidy. Yeah. So be, so being able to stay with messier feelings yes. is something that we're not very good at. And again, sometimes we, we sugarcoat it, like in the Facebook post, or like we said a minute ago, we strip it of value so that it seems easier. And sometimes we also, as I alluded to earlier, just kind of hang on to it. Like, oh, yeah, this is going to keep going. We don't have to say goodbye. We don't have yeah. to do that. Yeah. So there's something important, I think, about being willing to let something go, to yeah. know that the story has been told that the story has run its course and that it is time to let it go. And, uh, you know, at, at one point Jung says, life is a flux, a flowing into the future and not a stoppage or backwater. It's to be aligned with the, with the telos 
of all things, that all things are moving to an end and another end and another kind of target, and that we are all in states of transition, which kind of our Buddhist friends uh, talk to us about a lot, <laughs> and that so much suffering happens because we're not acquainted with the nature of that and perhaps haven't really thought about how to hold those transitions in a way that is, mm -hmm. again, beautiful to us. You know, I'm, I'm back on the word messy and uh, feeling. And I think that is a big part of it is um, it is messy and there is a lot of feeling. And here we are talking about it because that's uh, what we do to see if we can understand it more deeply. We have to use words. But the, the feeling state in a parting is almost like feeling flooded with both the goodbye and uh, the importance and how much we mattered, the relationship mattered. Uh, you had said treasure. So there is, it is a feeling state. And when we have such big feelings, it is common for us to want to disconnect from them because they can, they can feel overwhelming, even though these are beautiful feelings. I mean, I think it's this combination of sadness and, and also um, love and mm -hmm. joy, even at what we've shared. Yes. And and that's a lot. That that is a yeah. very full feeling. I'm remembering going to my my college graduation and I didn't bring any tissues. Oh. <laughs> you were sure that wasn't going to be necessary. Oh, no, I, I didn't I didn't think about it. I didn't I hadn't thought of it. And then I was in that room on that, you know, day mm -hmm. in May. Uh, surrounded by, you know, all my traveling companions over those four important years. And I was sobbing and I didn't have any tissues. Oh, gosh. It is about claiming the love. I think that that is exactly what it's about. Of We wouldn't feel so sad mm -hmm. if there hadn't been so much love and and fullness and mattering to one another, that it, something substantive has happened between the two people or, you know, for you at college of, these are four really big years. I think the highlighting of love, that's, that's what's different about the way that we're treating the topic today, because we might talk about endings in a lot of different contexts that are that have lots of different dimensions. But I think when we're using the word parting, that it somehow is invested with this ingredient of love, which both tempers the process and exalts it to a level of meaning that, that is unique in a parting, at least the way I like to define it. And I, I think the, another element we're talking about that we've alluded to several times already is the sense that something is coming to a close that needs to end. And we need to honor that. I mean, you know, Joseph, you mentioned before sort of um, following the telos and being aware of this movement toward the future. And it brings up for me a different kind of parting when my son was, uh, you know, 11 years old and like 10 or 11 months. So just about to turn 12. Uh, I had... Um, been out of town on a trip and I, as I often would do, I came home with a gift for him and I bought him a nice big Lego set to put together. And so he was happily putting it together in the other room and I was somewhere reading a book or something. And he came to find me with a kind of urgent expression and his eyes were filled with tears. And he said, mom, come here. So I followed him into the room where he'd been putting together the Lego set and he pointed to the box and the box said, for ages eight to 12. Mm -hmm. And I knew at that moment that he had understood that childhood was about to end. Oh my. And, and you know, maybe it's worth saying part of the context of this is that the, the most complex Lego sets are for eight to 12 year olds. They don't make them for older children. And he knew that. Mm -hmm. oh, he knew this was his last Lego set. And that you were able to share this 
parting that was emergent. Yeah, I mean, natural we, and emergent. There, not much had to be said. You know, we both just kind of cried. You know, also, I'm aware. You know that he's wanting to turn and have his next birthday. That the road goes on, and we want that too. But in order to go on, we have to leave something behind. We do. In fact, Jung says, quoting the alchemists, he said, there can be no new life, say the alchemists, without the death of the old. Hmm. And it is about letting the old life go. And if it's been a good experience or a good relationship, there there is this um, poignancy to it. Yes. Mm-hmm. And so the, in a sense, we're kind of advocating to the listeners, to to meditate upon parting, topically, to be able to embrace imagining parting and the way in which they want to live with it existentially. And then, as these things come up, that somebody has an established ground with which to begin to enter into the process more consciously. One of the images that I will very, very often over many years have used with um, clients that as their energy to part is kind of begins to activate inside of them, and it could be parting from a love relationship or moving all the different partings we can have, some of the partings resist the transition. You know, we'll hear about somebody talking about a transition sometimes for years. And what I offer to them is that You know, some partings, we simply have to watch and tend as if you're standing in an orchard in winter and you're watching a piece of ripe fruit and you're just waiting for the stem to just wither that last bit and then it will naturally fall. So a lot of the clients will talk about, I'm in this ripe fruit process, (laughs) (laughs) which I think that's a kind of attending to the parting and waiting for something organic and inevitable to simply signal the transition. Yeah, that that it can't really be manufactured by the ego, but it is waiting for a full cycle to complete. And this this is an image that comes up sometimes in fairy tales in the the fairy tale, the Nixie of the mill pond. There's all this stuff about these cycles that have these cycles of time that have to complete and you can't, you can't force it before it's time. So I think it's, you know, several full moons have to go, a certain number of full moons have to go by and then she can see her husband's head and then several more full moons go by and then she can see up to his waist or something like that. And, and there's a sequence, but it just, we, sometimes we just have to wait for the fruit to drop from the tree. And there's something nonviolent, I think, about a parting mm-hmm. versus other ways that we can separate. And that also allows so much more soul to be acknowledged because we're not distracted by some kind of violence in the process. I'm thinking about the kind of interiority and relationship to what Jung called the self with a capital S. If there is that present through a process of maturation and a timeliness, uh, then uh, we have grown through the college process or uh, about to turn Uh, to 12 years old, or a psychotherapy and psychoanalytic process of we are all more than we were before and uh, ready to, to move on because we have individuated, to use Jung's term, but there is a sense of I'm larger. Something has been filled. Something has grown that sustains us through the through the rituals of parting and the and the relationship but hopefully people should be more when it's time to say farewell i think that's it's great to address this that what is what is a possible foundation 
out of which that love and blessing and acceptance mm -hmm. and color the parting process. And it is, it is a relationship, a developed relationship to one's interiority, to one's inner life, to the self, to be in relationship to something that is not contingent upon the presence of various people or circumstances. And that allows us to be incredibly generous in the parting process because we have some treasure inside of us. Yes. And Jung talks about that as uh, one of the ways of describing the psychoanalytic process is finding the treasure hard to attain. And hopefully through all the relationships including something like school or college, uh, institutionalized rites of passage, we become more self-sustaining and less dependent on a relationship which may have been very important, helped us to grow, but it's time to leave. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and there's a readiness for it mm -hmm. and a gratitude for what has been. And when it's time to let it go, if we can't do that, then we risk really becoming rigid. We risk a forfeiting a growth opportunity. We risk stopping that flow of life. And I think that's really beautifully illustrated in this fairy tale called Princess Moonbeam. It's a Japanese fairy tale. And I'm, I'm going to tell it in a little bit more detail than I usually do, because um, I think there's so much about it that's relevant. So if you'll all just bear with me. It starts with a childless, childless couple. It's a woodcutter and his wife, and they pray all the time that they might get a child. And then one evening, there's a beam of light that lands amid the bamboo and the woodcutter goes there and he finds this beautiful little tiny, tiny person. He says, who are you? And she says, I'm Princess Moonbeam and my mother is the moon lady. And she has sent me here to be your child so that I may do a good deed. So the woodcutter brings her home. And of course, the woodcutter's wife is delighted, and they take such good care of her, and she just grows more and more beautiful. And sometimes Princess Moon, Moonbeam felt homesick for her moon mother, and she wanted to return there, but she loved her earth parents, and she knew that someday soon would be the time for her to return home. So pretty soon, everyone's heard about how beautiful she is, and at last, the emperor comes to this little a modest hut in the middle of the bamboo forest and the emperor stares at princess moonbeam and says well this is the most beautiful woman i've ever seen i have to marry this woman and princess moonbeam just says i'm afraid that is impossible and her parents are horrified they say you can't talk to the emperor this way <laughs> and and the emperor you know, gets really angry and he says i'm the emperor and i demand that you come to my palace with me tonight and she says, I cannot come with you. My time here is coming to an end. See, my moon mother comes to fetch me even now. And she points to the sky and there's this moonbeam descending, the silvery beam of light. And the emperor calls his guards and says, surround the house and shoot the intruder. So his men raise their bows and they loose their arrows. But as they do, they all turn to stone along with the emperor. And the moon mother comes down and is reunited with Princess Moonbeam and they embrace and uh, Princess Moonbeam accompanies her mother back up into the sky. And her earthly parents uh, saw all this from where they were standing and they start to cry knowing that their daughter is leaving them. And she runs back and she hugs them and kisses them and she thanks them for everything they did. And then she gives them a, a final gift. She turns their tears to fireflies ah. mm. so that on summer nights they would always be able to remember her. Oh, my. That's, that's so beautifully demonstrates that those who bring violence to the parting 
are are wounded in themselves. They're turned to stone in a way. When we can't allow the parting, when we can't embrace it, that it does kind of turn us to stone. It keeps us from growing, I think, is part of the message of the fairy tale. Yeah, the, the beginnings and the endings are like two sides of a coin, the heads and the tails. But if we try to hold on and hold on and hold on to something whose time has come to an appropriate close, then we fall into one-sidedness. Well, and we get very concrete, don't we? Exactly. And then that's imaged in the tale by uh, turning into statues, uh, uh, something that is fixed and cannot change. Mm -hmm. And and getting stuck can look like so many things. I have a poem by Anne Sexton, um, uh, which is really about the trouble with partings. And uh, Anne Sexton is a wonderful, very psychological writer, if those of you who don't know her. But she has a, a poem called The Inventory of Goodbye which is very much like this frozen, um, tortured refusal to part. She writes, I have a pack of letters. I have a pack of memories. I could cut out the eyes of both. I could wear them like a patchwork apron. I could stick them in the washer, the dryer, and maybe some of the pain would float off like dirt. Perhaps down the disposal, I could grind up the loss. Besides, what a bargain. No expensive phone calls. No lengthy trips on planes in the fog. No manic laughter or blessing from an odd lot priest. The priest is probably still floating on a fog pillow. Blessing us and blessing us. Am I to bless the lost you, sitting here with my clumsy soul? Propaganda time is over. I sit here on the spike of truth, no one to hate except the slim fish of memory that slides in and out of my brain, no one to hate except the acute feeling of my nightgown brushing my body like a light that has gone out. It recalls the kiss we invented, tongues like poems, meeting, returning, inviting, causing a fever of need, laughter, maps, cassettes touch singing its path, all to be broken and laid away in a tight, strong box. The monotonous dead clog me up, and there is only black done in black that oozes from the strong box. I must disembowel it, and then set the heart, the legs, the two who were one upon a large woodpile, and ignite as I was once ignited, and let it whirl into flame, reaching the sky, making it dangerous with its end, with its red. Oh, my goodness. You had talked uh, a while back about how uh, nonviolent a parting is, and this is a vivid contrast of her fury uh, about this kind of ending. I'm thinking about what, it might have been like for her to have to live with that feeling or for anyone to live with that feeling and the violence that it does against the person who harbors it versus a loving kindness and a gratitude and the poignance of the rightness of a parting. In the poem, she depicts this inability to bless Mm-hmm. parting exactly that, that image of just in a tight strong box much like the the stone emperor and his mm-hmm. archers and yet what we don't see in the fairy tale but in the poem is something oozes out of the strong box something is likely to ooze from those stone figures um, which is which won't let this mm-hmm. continue it demands something I want to bring us back to the gentle, poignant partings that we started with (laughs) and and remind us all of a particularly poignant parting in my memory, which is when I graduated from analytic training. Mm. 
so of the three of us, I was the first to cross over, although Joseph and Deb were cl- close behind me. But it was very full of feeling because I think part of the context is that we knew that once I crossed the threshold, that things might really change between us in our friendship. And we didn't know how or to what extent we would stay connected. Yeah, because we didn't have that container that we would be in the candidates group and studying together. Mm-hmm. You know, your journey in a certain sense had ended in yes. in terms of its the formality of being uh, in training. And I remember so well that evening and the two of you standing up with me and speaking and the poems you read and the tears the three of us shed together mm. at this parting and, and the blessing that you gave me with the, the Russian lacquer box <laughs> filled with all these loving notes inside. So it was a real blessing. A very, very special memory. And, and you know, it, it was a real goodbye. And we, we did um, allow ourselves, I think, to feel the full poignancy of it. And happily, we have constellated a different container. So sometimes you say goodbye and a new future does await. Exactly. When your son... Uh, was about to turn the corner uh, from childhood into at least pre-adolescence. Uh, there was the sadness at leaving childhood behind, but of course he wanted to move on. He was being drawn forward. Uh, th- there was, you know, he doesn't want to stay there either. He he wants to grow up, which is the healthy forward trajectory. Uh, that a parting also implies. Well, I'm left with a just a final thought that, you know, when a parting happens in the right way, there is a, a heart break, but the heart is also broken open. Mm, yeah, that's really, that's really <laughs> lovely. That's, that's, that's exactly right. Well, what I'm thinking is we need to part from this podcast on partings <laughs> and go into a new beginning of the dream. It's a small Great. parting, but nevertheless, here we go. <laughs> Hi, this is Lisa from This Union Life Podcast. Joseph, Deb, and I have been deeply moved by your responses to our work. Producing, editing, and distributing the podcast involves substantial expenses, and we need your help. Please stop by our website, thisunionlife.com, and click on the heading, Be Our Patron. You'll be redirected to our Patreon funding page. Patreon helps creators connect with people who believe in projects like ours. There, you can sign up with your credit card to support us for as little as a dollar a month, and at higher levels of support, we'll provide special episodes behind-the-scenes photos and stories, and a chance to join a select pool of listeners for dream interpretations. Thank you. So our dreamer is a 37-year-old male who is a social worker, and here's the dream. I was sitting behind a table in a narrow and small room. The placement of the table made it difficult to reach the only door out of the room. In the doorway was a reasonably pleasant African man, dressed in a uniform with various decorations. On the table, however, was a huge, dissected tarantula. Also in my possession, I had some sort of file that warned me of the danger of the poisonous spider. Apparently it had killed a man. I felt quite disturbed and claustrophobic in the small room, and I woke up. He shares a bit of context. He had moved between countries and made some significant changes in his life. He's looking for a permanent place to live, since he's now living in a temporary room in a friend's house. He tells us that the main feelings in the dream 
or that he felt cramped, disturbed by the spider, and he offers a bit more explanation. I generally dislike spiders, though not phobic. I recently lost a friend who was from Ghana, and I do live in a fairly small room. So, taking it right from the top, we've got a small, narrow room. And with a, with with a, a table. table in it, and the doorway's blocked. Yes. I, I was just thinking about that, of what it would be like to be in a small, narrow room with a table between me and the door. And it, there's a big, dangerous spider right in the middle of the room. Yeah. Well, That's it, the setup. It's a tarantula. Whoa, gosh, there are primordial creatures, and it's dissected. So it's dead, but it's kind of eviscerated. The, the thing is, if you, we even just think about the layout, almost the physical yes. space conjured by the dream, I, I get the feeling the spider is the center. If we were to draw it, and it's a very visual image, isn't it? And the spider is a kind of a round creature, the round belly with its eight legs going uh, around. I mean, we were all fascinated by this particularly uh, vivid image of the spider. This is not the spider in uh, Charlotte's Web, uh, who spells out the words in order to save the pig. You know, th this is a really different kind of spider, you know, the kind of gruesome, devouring, and it's a poisonous spider, so it's killed somebody. So we have a pretty dark, predatory, and primordial image of a spider here that is the round object on a rectangular table in a rectangular room, behind which is the dream ego. So one of the images that's just constellating in my mind is that the narrow claustrophobic room is another kind of spider web. The colonel perhaps being like a spider, jovial, and him being kind of trapped in this context, which evokes a kind of feeling inside of me. And, and I'm wondering if uh, perhaps the dreamer is also feeling rather trapped in his life, trapped in the small room, trapped in the sorrow of his friend that had passed away, trapped in circumstances. What what I'm thinking about is the contrast between uh, the, this difficult and trapped situation and uh, in the doorway, blocking the doorway, in effect, is is somebody whose feeling state does not match the dream ego state at all. It's a jovial attitude uh, kind of man. And here's our dream ego going, oh my God, I'm in this room with this big, dark, ugly, dissected spider. This is a gruesome situation that I'm in as contrasted with the African man. Okay, so if we're going to just take a totally classical Jungian approach to this dream, of course, we're all fascinated by the spider, and I know we can't wait to get there. <laughs> but I'm thinking about the dream ego, who is male, and across the table, kind of, you know, in the exactly symmetrically other side, is another man. And so that would lead us to think shadow. So if the African colonel is shadow, what might that tell us? Well, he's military and he's jovial. And the ego, the dream ego is, is annoyed at the joviality. So it might be that there's some more light-hearted, light robust, uh, energy in the unconscious that's associated with shadow, that the the dreamer can't quite claim that. I I agree with you that the diametric opposite in the room is this man who has a jovial attitude, in contrast to the dream eager's ego's sense of uh, horror 
at at what he is seeing is disturbed by the spider. So there's a real just mismatch between the dream ego and the spider, just in term and the I'm sorry, the African man, just in terms of the feeling states that they're in. I would be curious if if the dreamer were here to say where is this situation happening in your life? Where do these where does this mismatch of feelings occur? Where are you in uh, diametrically opposite feeling states with yourself? And he says he's moved countries and he's made significant changes in his life. He's looking for a permanent place to live. You know, I just want to say that we're saying that the joviality is a mismatch to the situation, but that's it's possibly not the case. Possibly the dream ego thinks it's very, say, frightening and somber or something mm-hmm. or claustrophobic. But really, from the attitude of the unconscious, there's nothing to be afraid of. And, you know, relax and take it easy. We got it. Yeah. You know, uh, so what I'm aware of is that the spider is dead. Yes. Uh, yes. You know, it's, yep. it's it's ugly. I don't think tarantulas would be very pretty and the dissected, eviscerated thing. Ooh, um, also kind of gross, but, but that's all it's Mm -hmm. gross. Yeah. I want to come back to just uh, something that I put forward before. I'm thinking about a couple of both friends I've had and clients that are African expats that the military in much of Africa at various times has been a very frightening specter. And even though within the power structure, the military leaders, sometimes warlords themselves, can be very happy about the power and the influence they're exercising, and yet be deeply terrifying Mm -hmm. to the civilian population. Mm -hmm. And whether or not our, our dreamer has experienced that directly or indirectly by observing this, Uh, at various times throughout the continent, it's a very ambivalent figure to have a big military figure kind of staring at you. So if I go back just to this paradigm of the spider and the way that I think the psyche can feel that, that sometimes these military powers are like spiders, civilians are caught in these uh, menacing circumstances not sure of how to escape or where what is safe or where safety could happen. I have a fantasy that part of his moving to various countries is trying to find the safe place, the place where he can flourish that is outside of the web of, of perhaps these primal nefarious forces. What I find perhaps encouraging is that he has internalized this system of predator and prey, of spiders and webs. How could one not living in that world? And I think what the psyche is offering him is the dissection of the spider complex, that the spider paradigm is on the desk. It's been broken open. Yes, it is a poisonous system, and he's registering that. He has knowledge of it. But can he unlock himself out of the fear and look into the spider and dissect it, co-participate in the dissecting of that complex in himself, and then perhaps not be frightened to walk past the military leader and into a different life that doesn't lock him into this paradigm. I mean, you know, one of the things that's really interesting about this dream is, and it makes it kind of fun to play with, is we have very little context. We have no idea where this dreamer's from. I mean, the dreamer himself might be African. We don't know that. This dreamer might be living in Africa. The dreamer might be living in Asia. I mean, we just we just don't know. So it it um it it's it's a real kind of screen that that we as <laughs> the people discussing it can just project a lot on i'm aware and uh i think you know that's a really interesting um take that you have joseph and we don't we it, there's not enough information for us to really say if any of that holds water in terms of the outer situation i mean he doesn't say he's afraid of the colonel 
the current, the, in fact, he says he's pleasant looking and he's jovial. I think, Joseph, you might have uh, really gotten a real intuitive take here. Um, and Lisa, your point is right on. We, we don't know. But I think what I'm really resonating to is that, as Jung says, the complex is the architect of the dream. And here we have the dreamer's complex, his spider complex, is right there out in the open, smack dab in the middle of things, uh, and uh, the secondary con uh, complex of being trapped, of a little claustrophobic, this narrow room, etc. I resonate to the dream offering him the dissection of his spider complex and he's going to have to literally get past it in order to leave the room. And the acknowledgement that this particular spider has been poisonous, right now it's dead. So he's also beginning perhaps to become aware of how negatively it has impacted him, the spider complex. So let's talk about spiders, because of course sp <laughs> spiders are an archetypal image. And they show up a lot in mythology. And incredibly ambivalent, like mm -hmm. all primordial things. Mm -hmm. It's a spider, but I'm going to, it's a very specific kind of spider. This is mm -hmm. not the spider that weaves its beautiful webs and spins its silken trails of uh all that jazz. That's not this kind of a spider. A tarantula is a big, hairy, scary uh, side of the spider. It's, you know, we talk about um, archetypes having, being bipolar and having a bright side and a dark side. And this is definitely the dark side of the spider complex. On the other hand, it's dead. Well, I'm aware that the spider is associated, and I take your point, Deb, you're right. It's a tarantula. But <laughs> the spider is associated with the great mother. You know, it's associated with the great mother in her terrible aspect as the weaver of destiny. And she is the great weaver who spins the thread of life and attaches all men to it itself by the thread of the umbilical cord. I'm willing to speculate as a hypothesis that, sure, um, maybe it's a negative mother image. I'm not sure that tarantulas spin webs. Okay, fair enough. I'm not sure that they do either. But could we imagine that this might be a negative mother image? It could be. So let's let's riff on that. So, okay. you know, he's a middle-aged guy. He's 37 or approaching middle age. Um, <clears throat> the specter of the mother um, or her desiccated body is right in front of him. And even in the presence of the negative mother, he's locked mm -hmm. up. Yep. Yeah, in this claustrophobic kind of way, you know, it's, it's, you know, sort of when he's in the presence of the mother complex, he is, his back's against the wall. And he hasn't realized that the spider is dead. So um, he's still kind of lock, locked in a fear that's not appropriate, at least to this particular spider. And perhaps the male figure who is powerful, military, disciplined, and jovial is the kind of this emergence of an aspect of his masculinity. Yeah, maybe. That might be able, be more available because the mother complex is no longer impeding the relationship between the ego and this masculine force. And it might even be more than uh, the mother complex. It might just be this sort of archetypal, gigantic primordial force of earth spiders and, and early myth and uh, that evoked nature's fateful consuming of fragile life and primal consciousness. Uh, so there's a monstrous quality that's um, separate from, from just the mother complex. But, but, but I go back to it's dead. I know, but there is something about the feminine <laughs> here, I think. And yes, it's dead. And I, I think it's interesting. So I'm going to, I'm going to, hang on to this idea that the spider has something to do with the feminine. Okay. okay? Because Deb, you just invoked nature, right? And, and this and, mother and, nature. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So either it's the, the mother you know, the mother complex or something about the, the chthonic feminine, if you will, that, that has, that leaves him somewhat not paralyzed is too strong. Although spiders do that, you know, they paralyze their prey, but he is, his back is against the wall. He's, you know, kind of trapped and spiders trap their prey. He also has a file with information that feels important information about the spider. So there's some element of logos as well. Yeah. There's some kind of information or data that can help him with this. And that the spider is a man killer. <clears throat> and we know that just from some of the science about spiders is after they breed, they will often eat their male lovers. Is that, <laughs> is that all spiders or is that just the black widow? Um, I think it's uh, many spiders. Really? I don't know if it's specific to tarantulas. Damn. I know. <laughs> Are you envious? <laughs> you, know, you know, this is, we have fixated on, on this dissected dead spider on the table. It's, of course. Uh, I have to just uh, note that for the record um, bec because uh, what a powerful image it is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it is the arc, it's the juicy archetypal image in this dream. I don't know. It's interesting because when I ask myself kind of where is the telos in the dream, I'm more interested in the African colonel. He seems He's like the new liberated thing. He seems like the new surprising element to me, but you have to get past the dissected tarantula to get to him. Mm -hmm. And there is a way in which an overwhelming primordial mother complex does kill off the masculine in the sun, mm -hmm. that he's not allowed to be masculine, um, that he always ever has to be the boy and the boy staying out of reach of the overwhelming power of the feminine, whether that's a biological mother or once it's internalized into him. And so to have that, have that killed is, is enormous in a, in a man. It's enormous. It's, it's really an, epic mm -hmm. moment in a man's life. Yes. And Jung wrote extensively about this liberation from the mother complex, and he pointed to all kinds of fairy tales where the young man slays the dragon or escapes the trap or, you know, it overcomes all kinds of things that are trying to stop him. Mm -hmm. Jung attributed all of that to a man's essential liberation from the the draw of the mother. Which requires the attitude of the hero. It's exactly it. The and, <laughs> and, and, and the colonel, I mean, a military man is a version of the hero, maybe, yes. right? Yeah. Well, the, not only that, he's got a jovial attitude, like, yeah. you know, th this is no big deal. Uh, and he is at the threshold. He's yes. standing in yeah. the doorway. Yeah. Uh, and so here's the shadow figure, you know, almost beckoning mm -hmm. of c come t toward me uh, across the threshold. Um, I think that's the telos there, mm -hmm. yep. uh, which is really very encouraging. And to think of him having made significant changes and moved from country to country, but now wants a permanent place. He may have wanted to move from country to country, much like the archetype of the Pu'er, feeling that he can, you know, fly from place to place. He's in a mood of adventure, etc. But something has changed that he's looking for permanency. He doesn't have it yet. That is a sign of that moving into that next kind of solid stage of masculine power. Hmm. And maybe that's a good place to stop for today. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living This Jungian Life.